you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Greenham Common today, an industrial estate in parts, other areas, ramblers, dog walkers roam. I wonder if they reflect on what happened here. The C-47, that's all brother, once parked here waiting to board young men of the 101st, who would fly then parachute in darkness into enemy territory. But we mustn't forget them. We have to remember what they achieved for us all. It was to them that we owe the freedom that we in this country and America has enjoyed. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. You know, what, what if it hadn't survived D-Day and all the other missions it flew after the war? The, this airplane doesn't just fly the, the missions on June 5th and 6th. It will also go on to participate in every major Allied airborne operation that's conducted in Europe. It flies in Market Garden as well. Any one of these missions is a, is a chance that that airplane is lost forever. Late on June the 5th, 1944, That's All Brother, an American C-47 transport aircraft, took off from England. It flew into history as the first to drop Allied troops into occupied France. Believed lost, perhaps disposed of in theatre, a fate that befell so many combat-damaged aircraft, that's all brother's final disposition has become something of a mystery. I distinctly remember a few weeks after joining the CAF, I read a blog article from Whitman Regional Airport and it caught my attention because it was where I used to live and work in, in Oshkosh. And it was a not a very well-read blog, but it seemed to be saying that the airplane that led the D-Day invasion was sitting in the boneyard at Basler. He kind of brought it to me with the, can this really be true? It seemed quite unbelievable. In reading the materials that were assembled, there was a number of sort of factual inaccuracies that sort of made it believable that the whole story was in fact false. It seemed totally beyond comprehension that in a country as patriotic as the United States, that the airplane that led the D-Day invasion, this incredibly important artifact, would be in a scrapyard. There's just no way that that can be true. It's going to be located in San Marcos, Texas, just south of Austin when it's finished. Okay. And right now we seem to be on schedule to fly it this fall. We're looking at late September or October. We'll be doing flight tests here at Oshkosh. How long have you guys spent on this so far? Uh, about four years it's been worked on. And it was on this airfield for 10 years before that. Here in Oshkosh? Yes. Bassler Turbo Conversions bought it something like 15 years ago. Uh, from New Mexico or Arizona. It was flown up here. Their intention was, they had no idea what they had. Their intention was just to convert it to a cargo plane with turbo, turbine engines on it and sell it. And it got pushed out in their boneyard, which you can see on the other end of the field, and forgot. They just didn't get to it. So how did you guys discover it? An Air Force Academy cadet about four to five years ago was doing a homework assignment on what happened to a bunch of planes at D-Day. And he started tracking them down serial number wise through the FAA registries. And this one was registers as having been sold to Bassler. So he called them up one day and says, have you got this serial number? And read one off and they pulled up on the computer and said, yeah, it looks like we did. And he said, would you go out and check? <laughs> And uh, they went out and checked and said, yeah, that's it. And then he explained what they had. And the CAF heard about it pretty quick. There were several other museums and organizations that wanted it too, but our mission is to fly them and repair them and fly them and show them off, keep the history alive. And Bassler kind of got behind
had that and we ended up with the plane. Okay. So once we get it to uh, get it flown and down to San Marcos, L3 Communications in Waco is going to paint it for us next year. Now they paint Air Force One and they do most of the military planes, a lot of them if not most of them. Uh, they'll look for an opening in their schedule and they'll paint it back in the original olive drab green and all. The invasion stripes were put on just before the invasion and it was secret what the markings were going to be. And so when, it, when they got the word out, they came out with buckets of paint and mops. And we're actually going to put the markings back on it with mops just like they did. The Stripes. It's 3X and it was plain W. I don't know why I'm even having to. None of that's on here now, but yeah, I've seen all the different markings and trying to learn about those. And they, they have one over at Bassler I was looking at this morning that was Tango 9, and, and I, was, I was looking at all that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, it's going to be marked up just the same. We've even got a little Scotty in there. The co-pilot on the first mission on D-Day took a Scotty, a little dog, as you can see on the side of the plane here. That's the crew when they just returned from the mission, and the co-pilot is in the center with the dog in his arm. And they put a flag jacket down on the floor and made a little bed for him and carried him that way so he wouldn't be injured if something came up through the bottom. And we've actually got the little Scotty in the bed up there. We're going to that detail on it. We will be jumping paratroop, reenactor paratroopers out of it. So we're setting up the static line and uh, the jump seats will be put in it soon. What has the reception been so far here at Oshkosh of seeing this aircraft? Oh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, the aviation world gets what this plane represents. Uh, people that we deal with on the street, uh, we go out and try and find donors because this is a very expensive restoration. We have to explain the history to them and just what this plane did and what it represents. Aviation people, you can just start talking to them and, and they get it. And the response has been overwhelming uh, here, at, here at Oshkosh. How much has been invested financially so far into this restoration? Roughly $2 million at this point, which would be ridiculous to put into a plane, any other plane. <laughs> Let me say it that way. But this one, we can't put a price on. We, we honestly can't do it. How much more finances do you guys need? Uh, we're about 350,000 short between that and 500,000, I think. And so we're we're here. Look, we just unloaded the donation bomb, and we're begging everywhere we can. Uh, but that's the kind of money that we need to finish this thing up. It's going to be museum quality, as close to as it was the morning they left for D-Day. Uh, I could go into the avionics panel. That's a little different, but. Uh, the instrument panel is going to look exactly like it did on the ground, but we're going to be able to pull the autopilot panel out and got all new Garmin avionics and everything installed. So it'll be the safest, most modern from a communications and navigation standpoint, but still on the ground. A person walking in will see a 1944 plane ready to go head for D-Day. Is there a website or any way that anybody wants to reach you for more information? Yes, the uh, Commemorative Air Force, uh, you can just Google that. Go to their website, there's quite a bit of information there. And then our unit is centraltexaswing.org and we've got quite a bit of information. It'll be the home base when the thing is finally uh, finished. That's all, brother.